If you go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6, we'll take a hiatus from the promises of God for this communion meditation. Galatians chapter 6. As you're turning, don't forget there's been a change in the year schedule. Elisha and Esther will be tomorrow evening, Monday evening. And then on Tuesday, prayer meeting at 10 o'clock. 6 o'clock that evening is nursing home ministry. Wednesday we'll be back here in our family worship night, kids classes, and then in the sanctuary, the Who Are We series. And then on Friday is our young married couples fellowship. And I appreciate the men that's been praying on Sunday mornings. And um, and I know that's going to have an effect. That's at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. We'll be back here Sunday. Uh, just a few more weeks is going to be Easter, Resurrection Sunday, I prefer to call it. Uh, but uh, let's begin to invite folks, friends and family, to come and be a part of that celebration. And we'll be preaching the gospel and praying that folks will be turned in their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. If you'd stand for the reading of God's Word, I'm just going to read one verse this morning, and then we'll be praying. The Apostle Paul says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he says, I'm not going to glory in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he tells us a little bit. In other places, he tells us other things the cross does. But here, he tells us a particular thing that the cross does. He says, I glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. I can't get to preaching yet, but let me tell you one reason so many Christians find so little joy in serving God. It's because they've never let the cross of Christ crucify the world unto them and them unto the world. You'll only attempt to serve God in misery until you let the cross crucify the world in your heart. Can you say amen? Amen. He said, I will glory in the cross. I want to preach this morning on cross glorying. Cross glorying. We are here this morning in this communion service to glory in the cross. If you're thankful for the cross, lift your hands as we pray over this sermon and thank the Lord for what He's done in your life through the cross of Christ. Lord, You're the one that came. You're the one that suffered. You're the one that bled. You're the one that died on that cross. You're the one that has risen again. We thank You, Lord, for the cross. We pray for the power of Your Holy Spirit to make Your Word real, Lord, this morning. In the name of Jesus, be here in this communion, Christ. We pray. Amen. You can be seated. I don't know if you've paid attention to it, but in the news cycle for the last few weeks, there's been a controversy. It involves Tim Tebow. And how that all came about is Tim Tebow had an invitation to speak at the First Baptist Church of Dallas. That's a historical church. They built new facilities. He was invited to speak, but the media had created a real controversy about the pastor, Dr. Jeffress. And what they have said is, Dr. Jeffress is a homophobic, anti-Semitic bigot, preaching radical things. And that had hit the media to the point that it affected Tim Tebow's speaking. And how that happened was, Tim Tebow said, I better not come now. Because there's all this, this attention, there's all this. And, and, you know, let's go back to Dr. Jeffress. He's supposed to be this very awful person, this radical. But in his words, which is true, he said, All I did was preach the gospel. That salvation is only to be found in Jesus Christ. And whether you're Buddhist or Hindu or Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. You to be saved can only be saved through the work of Jesus Christ. 
He did preach some other things. He said in His preaching that we need to be saved because all have sinned. And he said, adultery is sin. And fornication is sin. And homosexuality is sin. And because of those remarks, the media begin to paint him as this bigot, as this prejudiced person preaching radical things. And Dr. Jeffress answered, he said, how can you say it's radical when I've preached nothing but what the church has preached for 2,000 years? How can you say it's radical when I've only preached what the churches have stood for for 2,000 years? But because because of the controversy, Tim Tebow declined the invitation to speak. Now, I'm not here to say Tim Tebow wimped out. You can draw your own conclusions when you look at the data. What I am here to say this morning is that we live in a time when the society and the media are intent. They are purposefully intent on making it a shameful thing to believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation. They are with calculation attempting to make anybody that would say that only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ can a person's eternity be secured in heaven. They want to make that a shameful thing. How many has noticed today that things are completely inverted to what they should be? People are glorying in what they should be ashamed of. And they are ashamed of what they should glory in. We live in a society that glories in perversion and sin and blasphemy and going against the Word of God and try to shame somebody for believing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But I'll tell you something. I'm ashamed of the evil. I'm ashamed of the sin. I'm ashamed of what they put on television. But I glory in the cross of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. They say any who believe what I've been saying is a hate-mongering, bigoted, racist, mean-spirited. Or they say that if you believe that, you're unsophisticated, backwoodsy, uneducated, unthinking, primitive. But Paul said it's not that way at all. He said the only ones that are ashamed of this Gospel are those who have not let the cross change their lives. He put it this way in Corinthians. He said, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us who are saved, it's the power of God. I've got this feeling that if you think this thing about Jesus and the cross is shameful and foolish and ridiculous, I've got this feeling you've never knelt there and experienced the power of the cross to change your life. Because if you've ever been there, if you've ever experienced the power of the cross, it's not something to be ashamed of. It's something to glory in and say, thank God for the cross. Hallelujah. They've never been there humbly. If they had, they'd feel differently about it. People have become desensitized by the symbol of the cross. For some, they've so rejoiced over the results of the cross that they forget the realities on the cross that brought the results. For others, the cross has become an empty symbol because it's just a leftover icon. It's all that's left of the empty rituals and traditions of a faith that people and denominations let die. So some the cross is just jewelry. They can't even think of what connection it might have to truth. Amen. But I want you to think about it. You see the cross on t-shirts. You see it on earrings and on necklaces and on bumper stickers. But I want you to think about what the cross really was. You know, I, I lived in a time I can remember when people would go and be executed by the electric chair. Now, you, can you imagine some lady going and buying electric chair e earrings and electric chair necklace? 
Think about that. Okay, maybe not an electric chair. Maybe a guillotine. I got the, this real nice guillotine necklace. It's even, it even works. Put your finger right there. Okay, maybe not a guilty, maybe a, 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 a hangman gallows. Make a t-shirt up. With a, you know, that, that would be morbid. That would be awful because those are such awful instruments of execution. But could I tell you the cross was the instrument of the most cruel, most humiliating means of death ever. And it was reserved for the lowest, most despicable and despised criminals of that day. There wasn't anything good about that. It was awful, awful, awful. And yet, Paul says, it is in that very symbol of the reality of the cross. I'm not ashamed. I glory in it. I glory in it because I know what it did to my life. And I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. It might have been an awful symbol. But the reality is a powerful thing. You see, when Paul says, I will not but glory in the cross, the implication was there were Christians that were glorying in things other than the cross. What would that be? Well, he tells us in his writings, some Christians glory in their righteousness. They found somebody they were doing better than. They found somebody they, they esteemed not living as closely to God as they were having as many good works. And they gloried in their own righteousness. Others were glorying in their gifts and their abilities and their education and their intelligence. Others were glorying in their accomplishments and their positions in life. Even some in a twisted way were, were, were glorying in the fact that they rejected the Gospel and they rejected truth. Paul said, I refuse to be one of those that glory in man and man's ability and man's position and man's resources because I realize I'm only saved by the grace of God. I only have a home in heaven because of what Christ did. Therefore, I'm not glorying in religion. I'm not glorying in good works. I'm not glorying in my own. But I do glory in the cross that brought me salvation. Oh, if the church in our age today would determine to glory in nothing but the cross, I believe we'd see the power of Christ and the cross like never before. Some are so little involved and interested in the cross that they're neither ashamed of it nor are they glorying. They're simply indifferent to the cross and uncaring. I think that's even worse than being ashamed of the cross is to be indifferent to it. Amen. But Paul said he would glory in the cross. He gave a lot of reasons. I'm going to give you three quickly. I believe Paul says, I will glory in the cross because it reveals the love of God for me. I want you to think about it. You see the symbol behind me. That symbol of the real cross makes a powerful statement. Every time you see it, Brother Brock, the cross says, God loves you. And God loves you. And God, hallelujah. No wonder you can glory in the cross. It shouts to us from the darkness, God loves you. Paul said in Romans 5 and 8, but God commendeth His love toward us in that and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't start loving us by the time we got to the church pew and we're sitting there all cleaned up. He didn't start loving us when the moment we came to the altar. He didn't start loving us after we served Him for years and learned the knowledge of the Bible. While we were out in sin, when we were in the darkness, when we were covered with sin, when we were filthy with sin, when we were rebellious against Him, even then, he loved us enough to die for us. Oh, and I love 1 John 
The apostle said, hereby perceive we, or hereby know we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. I know how it is as a human and a man, whether young or old, you get those periods of your life where the enemy will come to you and circumstances will come to you and even your own thoughts and you'll hear it like a broken record in your head. Even God doesn't love you. God doesn't care for you. God doesn't really love you. I'm telling you, every time you start hearing those voices point to the cross and say, listen here, devil, you see that cross? That cross says that He loves me. I said, that cross says no wonder Paul said, how glory in the cross. It says He loves me. Anybody that rejects this Gospel and refuses to serve God is extremely ungrateful for the high price of love that God paid that they could be saved. I see that more as I age. Somebody that's heard the truth of the Gospel and will not surrender their lives to it. They're just ungrateful, ungrateful, ungrateful for the mighty love that God has shown. Don't you like to sing it? Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to me. Oh, the mighty gulf that Christ did span at Calvary. Hallelujah. Calvary. Oh, His love. There are those that have heard the Gospel story. They know Christ died for them. But they easily cast that aside for the trifles of this world. If they do so, they've never had a glimpse of just how much that God loved them to give His only begotten Son. But I'm telling you, if you take a fresh look at the cross, you would hear it shouting, Amen. God loves you. How in that wonderful to know in the times that we live. God loves us. Amen. At the World Trade Center, when they begin to dig out the debris, they found a cross-shaped steel construction of beams. It was left from the wreckage. And it looked like a cross. And so they decided it to put put that, that steel cross left over from the debris to put it in the World Trade Center Museum. And it's a black Last year, or maybe it was two years ago, the atheists said that offended them. And they sued to keep that out of the museum. I haven't read how that lawsuit came out, whether they've taken that out of the museum or not. But one of the leaders in that lawsuit, Jane Everhart, she said that cross shouldn't be in that museum because the cross is nothing but an ugly piece of wreckage that does not represent anything but horror and death. Death. Amen. Yes, that's true in a sense. Even those steel beams, they represent the horror and death of terrorism and wickedness and sin. And But that's the whole point. Yes, the cross is about death. It is about the horror of sin and evil. But it's more than that. Because on the cross, it was there that sin was conquered. And darkness was conquered. And demons were conquered. And evil was conquered. You see, we can see past the horror of the cross to the victory of the cross and through all the darkness of the cross we hear it scream to our heart God loves you I will glory in the cross secondly Paul said I will glory in the cross because it redeemed me from sin you can't get loose from sin on your own you can't change your own sinful heart the cross was the only way to free me from the penalty of sin. The cross was the only way to free me from the slavery to Satan. The cross was the only thing to free me from guilt and condemnation. The cross was the only way I could stand justified as if I had not sinned in the eyes of God and be freed from the certain sentence of hell and second eternal death. Why? Because it was the cross that paid the price to redeem me from slavery. It was the cross that was said, oh, we ought to be doing some cross glorying. I said it was the cross that set me free. 
The cross was the hammer that broke the shackles. The cross was the key that unlocked the door. The cross was the ransom paid for my freedom. Therefore, I'm not ashamed, but I will glory in the means of my redemption. I will glory in the means of my ransom. Oh, He has purchased us with His own blood. We're free. We're redeemed. My love divine. Glory, glory. Christ is mine. Last of all, Paul said, I will glory in the cross. And this is what he particularly mentions in this verse. I will glory in the cross because it releases me from the hold of this world. Now, make no mistake. When we were in sin, we could just walk away and leave it. We were under the hold of this world. But the sad thing is, there are people who have come to Christ who still are allowing the world to have a hold on their life and their mind and their attitudes and their desires. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory in saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. You know why Paul was attached to the cross? It's because the cross had disattached him from the world. That's what he said. He said, I glory in the cross because it broke the hold of the world on my life. You see, some people have never realized that even believers, the world is not something to love and to embrace. The world is something to be set free from. Paul said in the beginning of this epistle, in chapter 1, verse 4, he said, Jesus gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil world. Brother Cruz, Jesus died to deliver us from this present evil world. And yet the church in America has such an affinity and an attachment, so involved, so much a part of this world that many times you can't out there, you can't tell the difference between a believer and a non-believer. They're infatuated with the very thing that Jesus died to deliver them from. You know, and I want to be realistic here. The world does wield a strong pull and hold on people. The world does reach out to entangle believers in fleeting pleasures and pull them down in what is superficially glamorous and glittery and pleasurable. There is a power to this world. I want you to hear me. Without Christ, people are slaves to the world and the sin in it. But it's the unbeliever that's supposed to be a slave to the world. Not the believer. A believer shouldn't be a slave to the world's pleasure. A believer shouldn't be a slave to the world's passions. A believer shouldn't be a slave to the world's fads. Why? He came to set us free from this world. A believer should not be taken captive by this world at Satan's will. And I know, not only does the world reach out to get a hold of us, but there is something in our base nature that reaches out in response to get a hold of the world. How many knows it's a two-way street? The world is there to entice. But James said, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. But Paul covers both of these. He said, not only is the world crucified unto me, but I am crucified in the world. In other words, the cross kills those reaching out of the world for my soul. But the cross also kills that in my heart that is reaching out for the world. The cross crucifies the world unto me and me into the world. You know, I, I found a real phenomenon. And I want you to hear me because 
so many professed Christians act depressed to hear that a Christian should let this world go and abstain from it. You start preaching that believers shouldn't have anything to do with this world. I'm talking about its pleasures, its wickedness, its evil. And a bunch of Christians will get depressed and say, you mean i got to give the world up to serve Jesus? Not to you guys, but I'm telling you, what I'm preaching this morning has become a foreign message in the church world. And you can preach this in so many places and they'll look at you and say, are you for real? Are you telling me that if I serve Christ, I quit dancing and drinking and smoking and watching those filthy movies? Are you telling me if, if, if I come to Christ, I'll quit fornicating and committing adultery? And they act all depressed. I'm telling you, they got it all wrong. Their attitude ought to be, you mean the Christ... The cross of Christ is going to deliver me from those horrible things I used to participate in? You mean the cross of Christ is going to free me from my lust? You mean the cross of Christ is going to free me from that awful enticement of the world that looks so good, but when it gets a hold of me, it destroys me, leaves me empty, leaves me ruined, it leaves me used and abused. You mean the cross is going to deliver me from that? Hallelujah! Glory to God! I will glory in the cross that will set me free from that world. Preachers are constantly faced with the discouraging prospect that so many professed believers must be convinced, must be persuaded that the world is bad for them. Must be convinced that the world will lead them from Christ. Will siphon off their spiritual life. Will grease the slope of backsliding. I know that frustration. I've talked to folks... It's so discouraging that you have to get, look, and age shouldn't be a, a factor in this. But you talk to some young people, and so it's so discouraging. They don't even, be, it doesn't even begin to click that this world is not their friend. This world is going to destroy and ruin them, and they should be set free from it. Amen. We shouldn't have to convince folks that claim to know Christ that they should love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And if you have the love of the world in you, you don't have the love of the Father. Amen. And listen, one of my favorite verses, John finished that up by saying, and the world, that's why you want to be set free from it. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The cross will set you free from the world, that you can do the will of God. And when the world's on fire, you'll be in the presence of God. Every convert that has had new life should be rejoicing that through the cross of Christ He's free from this world. He's escaped its grip. And He can live in the liberty of Jesus Christ. Oh, return not again to the yoke of bondage. Live in the liberty of Jesus Christ. Those who supposedly bear Christ's name are enamored by the world He died to set them free from. I want you to think about that. Those who profess Christ are enamored. They're in love with the world. Christ died to set them free from. You say, I don't love the world. Oh, but you sing to its music that glorifies the things that destroy people's life and the things that Jesus died to set people free from. I don't love the world. Watch the filth. Watch the filth that exalts every kind of sin, that pushes an agenda to shame anybody that believes in the name of Jesus. That's not loving the world. 
There ought to be. I'm not talking about the people of the world. God so loved the world. I'm talking about that wicked system that sucks people down, like that big sinkhole that took the man out of his bedroom down down there in Florida. I'm telling you, there's sinkholes in that world. Amen. We're not to love that. We're to. You say, how can I hate it? It's fun. It's pleasurable. You can hate it when you see what it does to a family. You see what it does to a marriage. You see what it does to a young person that used to have the glory of God on their face and now they're bound by drugs and wickedness. Amen. I'll tell you how you hate it. You can see what it did to Christ on the cross whose preaching was marred more than any man so we could not even look upon Him. That's how you hate the world. Amen. And then you can glory in the cross that has set you free from the world. Paul rejoiced. He had been set free. And so how do we glory in the cross? It's not wearing a decal on your t-shirt. It's not going out and getting you some cross jewelry or even a cross bumper sticker. Oh, I can get in trouble in a hurry. I'm not going to get in this gun control thing in a message. But I'm not going to glory in the weapon I conceal and carry. I'm going to glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross ought to be our rallying cry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If the church would get busy being the church, preaching the gospel of Christ, we wouldn't have to worry about near as much wickedness as we're having to worry about. How many really believes when I'm preaching that the gospel of Jesus Christ can change your life? And that is the consternation. Because there is a gospel that can change the life of the most vile sinner and unbeliever. And yet we have Christians that have heard the gospel all their life. And they're enamored by the lifestyle of the sinner the gospel would like to change. Glory in the cross isn't in the jewelry. But glory in the cross is unashamedly living in the freedom from this world and declaring that Jesus has set me free. That's glory in the cross. I'm free with that. Once like a bird in prison I dwell. No freedom from my sorrow I felt. But Jesus came. And listen, and glory to God. Glory to the cross. He set me free. It's not that I can't live in this world. I've been set free from this world to live in Christ. Hallelujah. To live in Him. Would you come, those that are going to be singing, if you live entrenched in this world and mesmerized by what it has to offer, if you're pursuing the pleasures of this world, you are already entangled in its tentacles and you cannot glory in the cross. But if you see it for what it is and say because of Christ, I'm through with it. You can live in a freedom. Oh, how many glad you're free from this world? Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Didn't have to wake up with a hangover. Don't hear the voice of dope calling your name. Don't have a long list of regrets and sins. Hallelujah. We've been set free from this world. Glory to God. He died to set us free. What a gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. You may have come into this place bound this morning. You may think you can't get loose. You may think you can't live as a believer. I'm telling you that's a lie. The power of the cross has broken every fetter, taken captive every demon, overcome every sin. The cross will set you free. I will glory in the cross. How many like to lift your hands and glory in the cross of Christ? Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. George Bernard said he began to pray and study the plan of Christianity. He said when he did so, he could separate Christ from the cross. Yes, he believed in the resurrection, but he said every time he tried to focus on Christ, 
he'd see the cross. He said he had a unique experience. He said one day he was meditating on John 3.16. For God so loved the world, that gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he said it was like the words of that verse left the Bible and drew a picture in his mind. And he picked up a pen and he began to write. And the hymn that he wrote was the old rugged cross. He said John 3.16 came right off the pages of the, of the Scripture and drew a picture. I will cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, we know the verses on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross. We're the dearest and best for a world, for a world of lost sinners was slain. Listen, oh, that old rugged cross so despised by this word, you're a bigot if you believe in it anymore. I'm telling you, that is what the media said. You're a bigot if you believe the cross is the only way of salvation. You know, if there's another way of salvation other than the cross, God messed up big time. To send His only begotten Son to die when there's another way? It's a shameful thing to the world. Despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left His glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. I could read the rest of the verses, but I want to tell you a little interesting side note. Years later, he was telling the truth. That's when he wrote the song when he was looking at John 3.16 and he said the Scripture came off the pages of the Bible and drew a picture in his mind. But later, I'm not sure if it was after his death, I believe it was, but his wife said, told the rest of the story, that he was also in one of the deepest depressions and stressful, stressful life experiences that he ever had. And it was in that time that he saw the power of the cross. I know we got problems. I know we got temptations. I know we got difficulties. But we also have the cross. I know it's a struggle. Live for God in public school. Been there. I know at places of business there's wickedness and there's pull and there's temptation. And we have that to deal with. And we have sorrows and pains and people just being just idiots in our life. We have all that. There is a pull from this world. There is a siren that calls our name. But we have the cross. And I'm going to glory in the cross. As the servers come, could we lift our hands one more time and thank God for the cross? Would you thank Him across the building? Would you glory in the cross? Hallelujah. 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 I feel like I'm preaching to someone this morning. You long to be free. I'm telling you, you can be free this morning. You can be free. We're having communion. You can come to this altar. We'll pray with you. You can be set free. I can't set you free, but the cross can. The cross. Somebody in their mind, you need set free. He'll set you free with the power of the cross. I am nothing but a trophy of God's grace Poured out upon a soul so undeserving When on a cruel cross He took my place Every day I wake and 
Jesus.